Welcome to the Versus History Podcast with your hosts, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Connell Smith, and Elliot Watson. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of the Versus History Podcast. It's me, your host, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, on behalf of the editorial team. You can follow me on social media at History Chappie or at Versus History. But today, more importantly, I am joined by a very special guest. His name is Paul Rick Coffey, and he is the author of a brand new book entitled This Day in Irish History. Porik, welcome to Versus History. Congratulations on the new book. It's an absolute doozy. We're delighted to have you with us, sir. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Oh, the pleasure really is all ours. Let's get straight into it, shall we, my good sir. Tell us all about you, your background, and this fantastic new book, This Day in Irish History. So I was born in Sligo in the west of Ireland, and I grew up in Tupperkerry, which is the sort of the second largest town in, in County Sligo. And I attended university in Dublin and University College Dublin, UCD, uh, between 2005 and 2010. Uh, I took a year off uh, in the middle of that. My undergraduate was actually in English and philosophy, so it wasn't really history based. But when I did an MA, my thesis was on, it was on cinema and Northern Ireland, specifically the Troubles, which is obviously a huge source of interest for people. And many films have been made about it. So my, my master's was not strictly a history master's, but there was a lot of history involved. There were a lot of history books that I read, modern Irish history and British history as well. Uh, but you kind of delve into the past further. So I've always had an interest in Irish history and history more generally. And uh, that's sort of why I wrote the book. It was sort of an opportunity for me to research something myself that I could kind of compile. And because I had an interest in this, I figured that maybe other people would have an interest in this. And um, We'll probably get onto this, but but the book actually started as a social media account, which I started in 2018, uh, because I noticed that on social media, um, anytime you logged on on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, you would see people commemorating dates, commemorating anniversaries. They'd say, oh, it's 50 years since this happened, or it's 100 years since that happened. You know, it could be somebody's birthday, it could be the day that somebody died, it could be the day that an historic agreement was signed or a battle was fought or anything like that. And I thought to myself, what if uh, I were to focus exclusively on history related to Ireland? Because um, although Ireland would be mentioned in these social media posts that you would see, it was you they were usually a part of a you know a, a more global history. So it might mention something like the 1916 Easter Rising, which many people will have heard of, or the Good Friday Agreement. If we're talking about modern history, uh, but I thought, what if what if we could did that for every single day of the year? You know what what little things could we uncover, you know, because we, we know the big dates and we know the big events, but what about the smaller events that are maybe uh, less celebrated, less discussed, less well known. So that's what the book was all about. It, it kind of came from the social media account where I would sort of set myself a challenge of finding something interesting to talk about every day and then uh, expanding that into a book so that the people who follow the social media account could then say, you know, well, I want a little bit more detail here. I want to, I want something I could sit down and read and uh, or maybe give to somebody who I know is interested in this subject, but who maybe doesn't use the Internet that often or doesn't have a, a Twitter account or a Facebook account. So that's really where it, where it came from. Makes absolute sense, Paul. OK, just before we go any further, then what is that Twitter or Instagram account? How can we follow it? So it's just the words this day Irish altogether. There's no spaces or under, under uh, underscores or anything like that. So if you if you search for that on Twitter and on Facebook, I, I believe you can find it by typing in the same thing. I know that, you know, usernames aren't as common on Facebook. You tend to find the name of the page, but they're all linked to each other. So um, if you find one, you should be able to find the other. And then Instagram yeah, is like the same. It. Significantly fewer followers on Instagram, I have to say, because <laughs> I haven't been a, haven't been as diligent with updating that as I have been with the other ones because of just various various reasons but i i do update it now daily so even though there aren't as many followers on instagram it, it is still there there you go then folks get involved thank you very much indeed Porik. okay next question then a little bit controversial to get us kicked off and here we go if you were advising an alien from a far away distant planet on the best two and only two places Porik, to visit on the island of ireland which places would they be and why 
So for this one, I thought I would choose one close to Sligo, where I'm from, where I, where I was born and grew up, and then an, another one more generally. So for the Sligo one, I picked Ben Bulban, which is a mountain in County Sligo. And that's famous for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons that is famous that people might know is that it's where uh, the poet William Butler Yeats is buried. Now, William Butler Yeats, W.B. Yeats, very famous Irish poet, uh, Nobel laureate, um, he wasn't actually born in Sligo, but he wrote a lot of his poetry about there. And he, he died in France in 1939. But his last uh, wish to his wife was, and the quote is, and I'll, I'll take it from the book because I have the book in front of me, is, in a year's time when the newspapers have forgotten me, dig me up and plant me in Sligo. This is what he said to his wife uh, just before he died in France. Wow. And it, and it wasn't a year later, it was actually it was actually almost a decade later, it was 1948 when his body was taken from France and reinterred in County Sligo on the orders of Sean McBride, who was at the time the Minister for External Affairs in Ireland. Sean McBride, people might know, is, the, is one of the founders of Amnesty International. So it was taken from France, his, his remains were taken from France and brought to Ireland and buried under Ben Bulban because he wrote a famous poem called Under Ben Bulban. Uh, and a line from that uh, poem is actually on his headstone. It's it's it, the line is uh, um, cast a cold eye on life, on death, horsemen pass by. Uh, now, there's actually a rumor. I, I have to mention this. There's a rumor that the remains that were taken from France to Ireland were not actually Yeats's remains at all. They belong hey. to an Englishman who died in France at the time called Alfred Hollis. And there is there are there are some people who believe that there was a mix up with the remains and, and they they maintain that. Yates is not actually buried in Sligo at all, but Yates's family strenuously deny this. It's one of those things where we may never know the truth of it. But either way, it's, it's a lovely part of the world to visit, a lovely part of Ireland to visit. And the other reason I mentioned Ben Bulban is because historically there was a very famous battle fought there um, in uh, the mid sixth century, about 500 and um, 550, 560, around that time. It's hard to put a precise year on it. And what happened was um, Colm Kill, who was this famous saint born in County Donegal, who founded many monasteries in Ireland and in Britain as well, uh, actually, um, he controversially had transcribed and translated this book of Psalms belonging to um, Finian, St. Finian, who was the abbot, uh, uh, who was uh, an abbot in County uh, Louth. And this was a controversial thing at the time because um, Finian was not happy about this book of Psalms being transcribed and a battle erupted as a result of this. And what happened is Colin Kill tried to get uh, men from Donegal, where he was from, and men in Sligo uh, to, to kind of fight against uh, those who supported Finian because of this issue. And the battle was fought there. It was called the, the Battle of Kul Drenna. And 3,000 people died, but uh, it was sort of a, a Pyrrhic victory for, for Colm Kill. He was very unhappy about it. He felt very remorseful. And he ended up moving to Scotland and to Britain more generally, where he set up many monasteries. He set up 60 monasteries in Scotland alone. But this battle was, was sort of seen as one of the first instances of a fight over copyright infringement. And at the time, uh, there was a very famous quote, which a lot of Irish children learn about at school, uh, from the High King of Ireland, who was Gerbert MacKerville, who, who said, he, he decided that it was wrong what Colin Kill had done in terms of transcribing this book. And the quote he said is, to every cow it's calf, to every book it's copy which is something you learned about in school. So Ben Bulbin in County Sligo is, uh, is a place I would recommend. The other place I'd recommend, I'll go through this a little bit uh, more quickly, is a New Grange in County Meath. And we're actually recording this uh, in December. And in December, New Grange in County Meath is the site of many, many people because um, uh, back in the 1960s, Michael J. O'Kelly discovered that... Um, the winter sol solstice could be observed in Newgrange. Basically, there's an inner chamber that fills with light on the 21st of December. And it's about 60 feet long. And many, many people travel to see this. And according to O'Kelly, and some people have offered disputing claims, Newgrange itself is uh, over 5,000 years old. It apparently predates the pyramids in Egypt by 500 years. So it's an extremely important 
uh, historical site. It was declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in uh, in 1990 in the early 1990s 1993 i believe so new grange county mead obviously the site of a really um a really a really really kind of special place for people and the site of interest and then bell bulbin county like which is kind of reference someplace close to close to home for me thank you very much indeed porrick okay then let's segue into your book set the scene for us if you will what is this book this day in irish history all about and why did you decide to write it in the first place so as i mentioned earlier i started the social media account and um i got a lot of interest from people um not just in ireland but in in the uk in north america in canada in the usa in australia even in continental europe maybe to a lesser extent but there was still interest in it and occasionally people would say um, they would send me a message saying, is there anywhere else I can read this stuff? Because my dad would love to read this, or, you know, my, my uncle would love to read this or something like that. And I thought to myself, well, what if I were to write uh, a book, um, that way, uh, these people could maybe, could maybe, you know, give this to the people in their lives who they know would be interested in. The other reason is, as you, as you know, I'm sure, and as, as everybody listening to this knows, social media is a very, very, you know succinct form of communication especially Absolutely. twitter 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 is 280 characters which translates to gosh about about 40 words i'm not even sure uh, on average if we were if we, if were, to, if we were to uh, yeah if we were to guess it would, i'd say maybe around 40 words um which is very 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 short and so you can't really get a lot of nuance in there so i what what the book allowed me to do was to go into a lot more detail than i would get on facebook or on Twitter. Uh, that isn't to say that the book is sort of, you know, too in depth. It's 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 I hope a very accessible book, a book that anybody can pick up and read. And and it's not a, a not a tome. You know, it's it's quite a considerable book. It's over a hundred thousand words long. But um, because it's divided up into these short entries, each entry is about three hundred or so words long. You know, you get the information, you get you get the facts, you get sort of an interest, and then if you're interested, you can go and do further research on it. You could maybe pick up another book on it, or you can you can look it up online, or 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 whatever, or listen to a podcast about it. But it's sort of a, it's sort of a way of like whetting people's appetite to learn more about a subject, but giving them the overview. So hope, my hope is that anyone who reads the book will come away with with knowledge that they didn't know before. Even somebody who, who knows a lot about Irish history might say, oh, I never knew this or I never knew that. So that was sort of the, the reason why I wrote the book. Well, it certainly worked for me. It's a fantastic book too. It certainly whetted my appetite. Thank you, Porrick. Okay, and the next question then, in your view, what are the biggest misconceptions about Irish history? And how would you go about challenging these or perhaps if there's some truth in it, supporting them? Yeah, so this is an interesting question um, that I thought about um, because uh, it's it's hard to know really like how you define what a misconception is. But um, one thing I would say is that Irish people do know a lot about their history, but they do have their blind spots, just like British people, just like American people, just like people from every country. You know, everyone has their blind spots. Um, one thing that is commonly thought about Ireland, and, and I've heard it mentioned a lot, is that... Um, it's, it's discussing Ireland's neutrality in the Second World War. Now, Ireland was neutral. And when I say Ireland, I'm referring to the Irish state, because as we know, the island of Ireland is divided between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, yeah. which many people just refer to as Ireland. And this was known as the Irish Free State for many years. So you, 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 there's a lot of people will call you out no matter what term you use. If you refer to it as Ireland, they'll say you mean the Republic of Ireland. If you say the Republic of Ireland, yeah. they'll say, I don't like that name call it Ireland. But anyway, when I say Ireland, I'm talking about the 26 county state. It was neutral during the Second World War. It didn't even use the term Second World War. It used the term the emergency. But many, many, many Irish people fought in the Second World War with Britain and also with the United States. And when we're talking about the United States, we're talking about, you know, young Irish immigrants would have moved there and, you know, were a fighting age and so on. But many of them did fight with Britain. So that's a misconception that I think uh, is maybe not known. I've even heard it claimed that Ireland, not only was Ireland not neutral, but Ireland was on the side of the Nazis during the war. And this largely uh, has this, I would call this a misconception. This, this has came about, this has come about largely as a result of the fact that the leader at the time, Eamon de Valera, who was the Taoiseach, uh, visited the home of Edward Hempel, who was the German ambassador to Ireland after Hitler's death. And that was, it, many people will tell you, a, a blunder, uh, to, put it, to put it mildly, because many people had 
seen Britain fight against the Nazis, had seen America fight against the Nazis, and the fact that De Valera had visited his home, many people thought was an incredibly stupid thing to do. Other people have defended him and said, you know, well, he, he was acting as the head of government of a neutral country and so on. Um, but despite that, and I will say one thing about that visit is that um, Edward Hempel's daughter, who was living in Ireland at the time, uh, she said that she, her father was not a supporter of Hitler. Now, of course, you know, that's that's just her word for it. And that she actually compared the death of uh, Hitler at the time. This is much, much later. She compared it to the death of Osama bin Laden. She said, uh, Hitler's death didn't mean a damn thing to my father. He was happy about it, like we are happy about Osama bin Laden. And she stressed that the relationship between Emma de Valera and Edward Hempel was one of friendship and rather than it being, you know, the head of uh, the Irish state and yeah. the German ambassador to Ireland and so on. The other thing I would mention is that um, I mentioned the number of Irish people, or, or I said that many thousands, somewhere around 66,000 Irish people from the Irish state fought with Britain, and then about 64,000 from Northern Ireland. So from the island of Ireland, we're talking over 120,000 people fighting against uh, uh, Nazi Germany. And of course, not everybody in Northern Ireland would be a unionist. Many of them would be unionists, very proud of their British heritage, very much wanting to remain part of the United Kingdom. But many of them would be from a background that would be more nationalist in its leaning. So a huge number of people, one of whom was uh, Paddy Finucane, whose actual name was Brendan Finucane, who was the youngest ever uh, wing commander of the Royal Air Force. And he was shot down uh, flying back on a mission from France. He was 21 years of age at the time. And he's, he's, the interesting thing about him is that his background was very much a nationalist background. His father had fought in the four courts during the Easter Rising of 1916. Uh, but he then ended up joining the Royal Air Force, becoming a pilot, fighting for Britain against Nazi Ger Germany. And Winston Churchill had a famous quote for him because Churchill and de Valera at the time, they they tend they they exchanged quite a few harsh words just after the war. You know, Churchill said something very negative about Hitler, uh, about, uh, about De Valera, and you know, referenced his visiting uh, Edward Hempel. De Valera returned in kind. It was sort of a kind of a sparring sparring match at the time, verbal sparring match. But one thing that Churchill said that's interesting is he said, "If I ever feel, if ever I feel a bitter feeling rising in my heart about the Irish." the hands of heroes like Fanukin seem to stretch out and soothe it away. That's the, that's the quote. Now, some people wow. might hear that and focus on, you know, uh, <laughs> the first part of it where he talks about a bitter feeling. But I think it shows you that the mis a misconception there is that, you know, Ireland and, and Britain or Ireland and England are constantly at, at, you know, at war with one another when really there was a lot of cooperation. Another thing I'll say very quickly is... Um, even though Ireland was neutral during the war, it did allow uh, a strip of land called the Donegal Cor Corridor, which is in the Irish state, to be used by planes flying over. And this actually reduced the unprotected gap in the mid-Atlantic by at least 100 miles. So it actually helped um, the Allies in the war. And this was a this was not well known at the time. It was sort of a kind of under the table deal to the Irish government and the British government. But this is a strip of land sort of uh, to the west of Northern Ireland. So sort of, if you know where Donegal is in Ireland, the top left corner of Ireland, um, top northwestern corner. And it's sort of a thin strip of land there that was used by planes at the time. So even though it was neutral, it was, it was as some people would say, neutral on the side of the Allies. So that would be one misconception about Irish history that I would, that I would seek to sort of correct, I suppose. Um, another misconception, very briefly, is... Ireland came to be part of the United Kingdom in the very early 1800s, very early 19th century, after the Act of Union. And the Act of Union was a decision that was taken at a time when Catholics in Ireland did not have, uh, did not have the franchise, did not have the vote, really. It was a decision mainly taken by the Protestant um, representatives in Ireland. But what many people don't know about that is that many Catholics at the time supported the move because they felt it would lead to Catholic emancipation. Now, Catholic emancipation came much later, about three, three decades later, around the time that Daniel O'Connell was elected uh, an MP to the, to the House, House of Commons. But um, it's something that isn't known at the time, that actually, far from uh, Ireland joining the, the UK or you know, joining with Great Britain to create the UK, um, far from this being something that Catholics fought against, many of them supported it. Now, that's not anything to do with 
anyone today, but it's just it's an historical fact that seems to get a little bit forgotten. So history is not as simple as I'm sure you know, and, and your listeners know history is not as simple as people often make it out to be. So that's another thing I would I would point out is maybe a misconception from both sides, from maybe sort of a, a British side and an Irish side uh, ab about Irish history. Transitioning into a theme you've already touched on, the relationship between England specifically and Ireland. So let's be frank then, that relationship has been troubled throughout history to say the very least. If you were put in charge, Porik, of forging a better future between these two nations by both governments simultaneously, what would be your top priorities and actions? Over yeah. to you, a this was hypothetical. A... <laughs> yeah, this was another difficult question that I had to I had to think about, and I really, I, I you know, ultimately, I'm just, I'm just kind of speculating here. I'm not qualified to really make, make, make this, uh, make any kind of uh, suggestion here. But I mean, it's hard to say what the British and the Irish governments, respectively, should do. And anyone listening to this knows right now that we're still in the midst of uh, the UK's withdrawal from the European Union and yeah. issues over the border and issues over the yeah. Northern Ireland Protocol and all of that. Yeah. And really, it's, it's, it is a complex one, and it's kind of, it's kind of sad to see how bitter this this can get i mean one thing i would say is honestly if 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 i don't know how much people in ireland and people in the uk listen to their leaders i would uh, i would ask the leaders to tell people to maybe spend a little bit less time on social media and i'm aware that that's an ironic thing for me to say because my book started as a social media account but if you spend too much time on social media you really get sucked into these constant arguments and and uh, you know sniping at one another and 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 it's it's really kind of a sea of negativity there's a lot of great stuff about social media obviously this podcast reaches many people through social media um my books as i said many times started as a social media account but maybe i would say spend a little bit less time on the social media where people get sucked into arguments with strangers and it's always anonymous strangers <laughs> it's never people showing their faces usually it's it's people with a a, a flag in their profile. I would even say a flag of a particular country. It's always flags or emblems of some kind or another. Maybe spend a little bit less time on social media and focus on the things that that uh, the British people and the Irish people have in common, because they do have a lot in common. They're obviously different. They're different countries. They travel the world with different passports. They have different elections. They're different people. But there's a lot in common. There's a sort of very similar climate, a uh, very similar culture. You know, I mean, if you go into an Irish home any day of the week, there's a very good chance they'll be watching a British soap opera or uh, a British football team. And likewise, you know, consider the contributions that Irish people have made to Britain in terms of entertainment, show business, uh, broadcasting in the last 100 years. I mean, everybody knows Eamon Andrews, Terry Wogan. We go to the modern day, Graham Norton, Dara O'Brien, um, writers like Edna O'Brien, who's obviously Irish, but lives in the UK. I mean, there's, there's massive, massive uh, sort of, for want of a better word, cross pollination between the two countries in terms of culture. So I think I think maybe spend a little bit less time on social media and a little bit of time focusing on the differences and a little bit more time focusing on on the things that they have in common. That would be my advice. But I, I don't know how that would sound coming out of a politician's mouth. But, uh, <laughs> well, it's pretty good life advice, to be honest, Bori. Um, yeah. Anything else you'd like to add? We're happy to move on to the next question. Uh, we can move on to the next question. <laughs> Let's go for it then. All right okay. then. So championing and showcasing underrepresented histories is a key focus for Versus History and many other groups too. And could you tell us about the achievements and contributions of some minority groups, whoever they may be, to and in Irish history? This was a little harder to think about. Um, one thing I would say is that Ireland has not had the best history when it comes to representing half of its population, namely women, or maybe a little more than half of its population. Um, there have been a lot of laws, particularly since Ireland became independent, uh, that have maybe been behind the times. Um, many people will be aware that in 2018 there was a referendum in Ireland on lifting a constitutional ban on abortion. And I'm aware that abortion is a very uh, controversial subject, but if you compare that to the UK, specifically to England and Wales, because it wasn't available in Northern Ireland. Uh, but abortion has been available since the 60s. So the huge difference there, obviously, in America, they have uh, Roe versus Wade, although many people are kind of uh, trying to trying to uh, 
change that now at the moment in the United States. But historically, Ireland hasn't always been great in terms of uh, women and its representation of women. Uh, what I would say is there have been exceptions to this. Uh, one of the exceptions is in 1918, um, the first woman ever elected to the House of Commons, because back in 1918, all of Ireland was part of the UK, part of the United Kingdom. The first woman uh, was a woman representing an Irish constituency, and that was Constance Markovich. Uh, she did not take her seat in the House of Commons. She was an abstentionist uh, candidate, um, which meant that she you know, stood for election, was elected, but did not go to the House of Commons because she you know, did not recognise the authority of the House of Commons or the authority of the British government. She was actually a member of Dáil Éireann, which was the revolutionary parliament set up in 1919. Uh, subsequently, she became um, a candidate for the party Fianna Fáil, which is currently in power in Ireland. Their le leader, Michal Martin, is the Taoiseach of Ireland, the, 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 the leader of the Irish government. But um, uh, that was a first um, it, in Irish history and in, and, in, and in British history as well, in the history of the UK. The first woman ever elected uh, to the House of Commons. Uh, happened in Ireland in 1918. Another thing that happened post-independence, so post-1922, was in 1925, Una Kyo became the first woman stockbroker in the world. She uh, joined the Dublin stock, stock market that year in 1925. And just to put a bit of contrast on this, this was an unusual thing at the time. So the first uh, woman to join the, the New York Stock Exchange was in 1967. And the first woman to join the London Stock Exchange was in 1973, so quite a few years later. So this was very unusual at the time. That doesn't mean that she didn't face challenges. She did, of course, face challenges at the time, as, as did all women in Ireland. Uh, but the fact that she was able to join there shows that there was some of that spirit in the early part of the, the Irish state, or the spirit of equality, which, which didn't always uh, come to the fore. Um, so yeah, another thing about another thing about Irish history and about women is that Ireland is the the only country in the world to elect two heads of state, two female heads of state, uh, consecutively. Now the head of state in Ireland is the president. Current president is Michael Lee Higgins. This is largely a ceremonial role. It's not. It's, it's sort of the equivalent of the the monarch in the UK. It's sort of the equivalent of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, the the role of the president is not is supposed to be an apolitical one. But um, in, in the early 90s, Mary Robinson was elected the first woman president of Ireland. And then after she left office, uh, Mary McAleese uh, was elected the, uh, the second woman president of Ireland. And this was the first time in history that this had happened, that two female heads of state had been elected consecutively. Of course, there have been heads of state that are appointed, but this is the first time that the voters actually uh, put, put those women in power, albeit a power that's a very limited power. It's more, more of a ceremonial position. So those are some examples um, of, of uh, representation of, of women, which hasn't, as I said, always been the best. But that was sort of what jumped out at me. There probably are other examples. I mean, we could get into people of color. Um, we could get into minority groups. Um, I, I honestly don't feel uh, qualified enough to, to comment on that. I just simply don't know enough about it right now. But um, that is something that I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, um, it's kind of, it would be a rich source for, 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 for research and for, for people to talk about. Many of you might know um, the uh, Irish Nigerian writer, Emma Dibiri. I know she's written a lot of books about this. Uh, where she's written a couple of books about this, but she's written about this in detail about being growing up in Ireland, not being white, having a, having a background that was different from the majority and uh, sort of what that was like. Um, but yeah, in terms of representation, representation of, of minority groups, that was something that kind of jumped out at me. Moving towards the end now, and it will come as no surprise, I'm sure, to any of the listeners to say that emigration has been a distinguishing feature of Irish history. My own personal anecdotal history, I suppose, speaks to that it's when my ancestors moved, many of them to America, but a few to the UK. And what have been the key features of this thing, so emigration, and how does this feature in your book? So emigration and Ireland, Boric, over to you. So it features quite heavily in the book because so the concept of the book is that every day of the year, 1st of January, 2nd of January, 3rd of January, I talk about an event in Irish history or event in history that involves Ireland in some way. And the very, very first entry in the book, January 1st, 1892, was the first uh, immigrant ever to pass through Ellis Island, 
who was Annie Moore, and she was from County Cork, and she passed through with her brothers, Anthony and Philip. Um, she was 17 years of age at the time. And she's somebody who has been referenced, you know, many, many times in Irish history. Um, there is a, a, a song written by Brendan Graham called Isle of Hope, Isle of Tears, all about this. And in fact, her, her voyage through Ellis Island was referenced in 20 or 2008 by uh, Barack Obama, who was then running to be president of the United States. Um, he was the Democratic nominee at the time. Um, there was an event in Calvary Cemetery in Queens, which is where she, she and her family uh, ended up living, uh, which was read out. At, at which a letter was read out by Obama in which he said the idea of honoring those who came before you by sacrificing on behalf of those who follow is at the heart of the American experience. Irish Americans like your ancestors and mine from County Offaly understood this well. Many people will know that Obama, when he visited Ireland, uh, visited people in County Offaly with, with, who he, he with whom he had uh, uh, some lineage. It was going back quite a bit. You know, it wasn't like one generation or two generations, but still they're very, very proud if you go to uh, County Offaly of, uh, of uh, Obama having roots there. There was actually a song at the time called There's No One More Irish Than Barack Obama. It's kind of a silly song, novelty song, yes. but you know, it, it shows uh, how, how much the Irish uh, love it when somebody who has some Irish lineage does well abroad. It's another feature of immigration. I mean, emigration, you mentioned emigration to the UK. That's obviously been a huge, huge, huge um, target for, for Irish immigrants, the United States as well. Um, lesser known would be uh, France. So um, wow. in the, the late 1600s, there, there was a thing called the, the Flight of the Wild Geese, which was when about um, 12,000 Irish Jacobite soldiers uh, so supporters of, of, of James, King James II, uh, fled Ireland to France and uh, spread throughout France and throughout the continent, one of whom was a man called Anthony uh, McCartan, who was from County Down, and he was the ancestor of Charles de Gaulle. The, the future French president, who was president, of course, during the Second World War. Now, of course, Charles de Gaulle had lineage from France and from probably other European countries, but he did trace his lineage back to um, that the, the late uh, 1600, 1691 it was, and when this event, the flight of the wild geese took place. And, and in, in the 60s, he visited Dublin, uh, de Gaulle did, and the ceremony was held for these distant relatives. So, you know, when we, when we talk about Irish emigration, we talk about parts of the world where, where Irish people have gone. Of course, we tend to think of English speaking countries like the UK, Australia, Canada, United States, etc. But there are also other parts of the world where they have gone and where their where their ancestors have ended up as well. So it's it's a huge part of Irish history, um, and I did try to touch upon that in the book. And there are several several uh, entries in the book which touch upon that that very subject. Thank you so much. Obviously, the American story and to an extent the English story, the Canadian also and Australian too, Ned Kelly. Oh, uh -huh. relatively well known, but France, I had absolutely no idea that France featured in that story whatsoever. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. I suppose it remains for us to say then. So is there anything else you'd like to mention before we conclude that uh, my limited and short-sighted questions haven't given you the chance to address that you would have liked to have said about your book, Porrick? Um, not really, other than I, I hope that people will um, maybe seek it out if they are interested in learning about Irish history. It's meant to be a very palatable book, a very accessible book. Um, it's, it's not a book that you, that you necessarily need to read from cover to cover. I mean, if you do, that's great because you, you'll take in everything that the book covers. But um, it's not written in chronological order, although there is a list of chronological events at the back of the book. So you might find yourself looking at an entry and going, um, that one doesn't interest me as much, but maybe the next one will, or the one after that. So it's a way of getting a sort of a crash course in, Ir crash course in Irish history. Um, and there are other books out there that probably go into more detail, but sometimes those books can be a little bit intimidating. You know, you have to start at the beginning, work your way through, and maybe some parts of it appeal to you more than others, but you kind of have to stick with it going from, from you know, page to page to page. This book is a, it's a book you can either sit down and read from cover to cover, or it's a book that you can sort of dip in and out of. You can use it as a reference book. You can go to the, to the index and go to the chronology and think, I want to, I want to read about Ireland in the 1960s or in the, the, the mid 18th century or the, the mid 19th 
19th century. I want to see what was going on then. And then you can go to, to that specific page and read about that specific event. And the other thing is it might kind of spark your interest in another subject, which I kind of mentioned earlier, which is sort of, um, you know, another reason why I wrote the book. So somebody might read about Ireland in the Second World War, they might read a couple of the entries in the book where I touch upon that and get an idea that it was a little bit more complex than it's sometimes portrayed as being. Uh, and then, you know, there are books written exclusively about that subject, or there are books written exclusively about, you know, um, the subject I previously mentioned, the, the flight of the wild geese, when, when these uh, defeated Jacobite soldiers went to France. So that was sort of the point of the book. So I, I do hope that, that if people are interested in the subject and maybe want to learn more about Irish history, that, that, that they'll consider this as a book to read because it is meant to be an accessible book. And I'm hoping it's an accessible book that will maybe, you know, spark their interest in, in Irish history and, and have them come away learning something that they didn't know before. You certainly achieved that, Paul, Rick. I mean, for myself, I've got an exceptionally Irish name and and some very strong Irish ancestry, although it's quite distant. And to all intents and purposes, I am an English chap, although I do live in the kingdom of Bahrain now. I bought it exactly for the purpose that you're talking about, just to sort of dip my toe to get an hors d'oeuvre, to get an entry point or a gateway into Irish history. And it certainly delivered on that purpose. It's, it's, it's given me so, so much breadth. And if I wanted to go deeper on any particular topic, it sort of gave me a gateway into doing that. So you've absolutely 100% achieved that. It's a fantastic book. It is very accessible. It's very gripping. It's very, very entertaining, albeit with some of the more, I'd say, dark elements of Irish history. No one needs to say Oliver Cromwell's name too loudly, but there you have it. And it certainly helped me feel a bit closer to a part of my own lineage and life that I hitherto knew very little about, which is Ireland. So thank you very much indeed, Paul Rick. Just remind us before we say goodbye then, um, the title of the book, um, who's it published by and where can we get it? So it's, uh, thanks Patrick for all that. Um, it, the title is This Day in Irish History and it's published by O'Brien uh, Press in Dublin. And uh, you can get it from the, all the usual sources um, online and so on, uh, and hopefully in good bookshops. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of COVID and there are supply chain issues and so on. But hopefully, if you want to get your hands on a copy, you should be able to, to do so on the social media accounts, as I mentioned earlier. If you just type in This Day Irish, you should be able to find it there on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and so on. Nice one. Thank you. Okay, so it's Pour It Coffee and it's entitled This Day in Irish History. And why not go and pick up a copy? It's an absolutely fantastic book. Um, so thank you for writing it, Porik, and thank you for joining us on the Versus History Podcast. We'd be delighted to have you back anytime that you want to come back and join us. Thanks very much, Patrick. All the best. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Versus History Podcast. Visit us at www.versushistory.com and follow us at Versus History on Twitter and Instagram. You can download all episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify or from wherever you get your podcasts.